Words are the best and also the worst. At three years old, most kids know somewhere between 250 and 1,000 words. I knew about 25. Rightfully concerned, my parents took me to the doctor. A few theories were discussed, the leading of which considered my limited vocabulary to be a result of a string of ear infections that made it harder to hear, and my pediatrician suggested that I attend Kids on the Move, a local organization that assists kids who require a little extra attention. I don't remember much about my time there. I was three, after all, but I do remember the outside of the building being yellow, and that the library inside had a copy of my favorite book, Freight Train, that I hogged every reading time, even to just look at the pictures. You should look at the pictures. Thanks to the teachers at Kids on the Move and my parents' help at home, I started to put more words and sounds together, but there remained a few letters that were tough to pronounce, particularly the ridiculously rude and rancid 18th member of the alphabet, R. During my elementary years, R was my kryptonite, my Voldemort, my semantic curse, and other words I wouldn't have been able to properly pronounce back then. R was the troll guarding the bridge that connected my shy and confident selves. My inability to consistently say my R's correctly discouraged me from raising my hand in class or speaking up at home or with friends. I felt embarrassed, which unnecessarily has two R's, but I digress trying to articulate the thoughts in my head, only to flub up the delivery. To remedy the issue, I started meeting with a speech therapist after school. I'd repeat after her, ran, room, read, ring, and earn stickers after every successful session. My linguistic conquest came months later, after I, for the first time, successfully read green eggs and ham without any R's sounding like W's. The moment was so big, that after reading the book to my mom, I called my dad into the room to show him what I could do. My newly acquired speaking skills and confidence sparked something within me. I couldn't stop consuming words, whether they appeared in or on books, magazines, newspapers, sports cards, toys, tags, cereal boxes, billboards, maps, then sharing with anyone who'd listen, willingly or not, what I had just learned. As a kid, I had a particular interest in state capitals, stats, and symbols, Did you know that the most popular state bird is the cardinal? Seven states, called the little guy their top flyer. Looking back, I'm convinced the extra care and attention I required to learn how to properly talk cultivated my interest in communication. I discovered an admiration for word choice, punctuation, and sentence structure. I started seeing language as an art. Sure, that sentence makes sense as is, but how else could it be written? How else could it be said? What if I erase this word here? and add this word there, or what if this paragraph starts this way, or maybe... As I grew up, I wondered how I could turn my interest in language into a profession. My dual obsessions with words and athletics made being a sports broadcaster and journalist an easy dream to dream. I enrolled at Utah Valley University with this dream in mind, and while I don't currently cover and commentate on sports for a living, I did earn a bachelor's degree in communication with an emphasis in journalism. And now I get paid to write and talk. Determination, good doctors, supportive parents, and Sam I Am turn a personal weakness into one of the few things in my life that never ceases to excite. I love words. I love to write them, say them, hear them, and learn about them. I find words, their usage, and their history to be fascinating. But I also hate words. I think words are the best and also the worst. I love and hate words because they can build as much as they can break. Author Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote, Words, so innocent and powerless as they are, as standing in a dictionary, how potent for good and evil they become in the hands of one who knows how to combine them. Words alone mean nothing, but once we employ them to represent our personal thoughts, feelings, emotions, and reactions, we hand them immediate influence. Every time we write or speak, we're choosing to trust a combination of letters and marks to properly communicate what's going on inside. And sometimes that's great. And sometimes that sucks. When it's great, it's really great. Do you remember the first time someone said to you, I love you? But do you also remember the first time someone said, we need to talk? The same letters that can cause a heart to skip a beat can also cut straight through it so that the heart feels it may never beat again. What power words yield? 
I honestly believe whoever coined the adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, was either a liar or a poor listener because words can and do hurt. But words also heal. Words crush and words console. Words offend and words fix. Words solely and words sustain. With our assistance, words have the ability to change a life, for good or for bad. How many relationships have been irreparably fractured because of a conversation turned poor? On the other hand, how many failing relationships were cured once the right thing was said at the right time? It's not the fine-tuned bicep or the worked-out hamstring that is the most powerful muscle of the body, but the tongue. For it's with our mouth we most effectively throw, run, toss, construct, and destroy. What words do, as Hawthorne explained, is up to the communicator. Whether words are a tool that tightens or a weapon that weakens is up to their user. Speaking and writing, then, come with some level of responsibility. Culture, circumstance, and context teach us which words are okay to say, which words are not okay to say, when to say certain words, and when to keep our mouths shut and our thoughts to ourselves. With so many rules, written and unwritten, regarding words, mistakes are bound to happen. Let me take us back to 2009 and into my ninth grade Spanish class. The night before, I had watched a comedian stand-up special where he used the word mofo. I had no idea what the word meant, but I knew it drew a bucket of laughs from the audience. Being the quiet yet opportunistic class clown that I was, after successfully translating a sentence on my worksheet, I said to the kids around me something like, That's how it's done, mofos. Just like the comedian's crowd, they laughed too, and now I had a new funny word to say. It wasn't until weeks later that I learned that mofo is an abbreviation of mother effer. Considering the culture, circumstance, and context I had and was in at the time, I quickly stopped saying the pithy short swear. Less silly and more overt uses of inappropriate language can lead to shame, embarrassment, discrimination, and acts of destruction towards self and others. Words, considered and crafted for ill, can have unconscionable consequences. Whether words are the best or the worst is up to us. I believe it is our duty to use words wisely, to respect the power they hold, to communicate carefully and deliberately, for we can make or break our day or the day of another with a particular combination of prepositions, conjunctions, subjects, verbs, nouns, periods, and question marks. In a world where a little bit of good can mean a whole lot, let us often and on purpose communicate for good. Tommy.